Welcome to the 13th and last lecture on parallel programming with OpenMP and MPI. Today's topic is MPI plus OpenMP hybrid programming. So first of all, why should we combine two uh, programming models into one? First of all, if you look at modern cluster topology, then part of it, namely the part inside a node, a shared memory node, is accessible to shared memory parallelization. And uh, it seems to be the natural way to program this subsystem uh, to use some kind of threading model. Now, in high-performance computing and scientific computing, OpenMP is the typical choice for that. So um, the basic idea is to combine the threading on the node level with MPI between nodes, so that message passing is done with MPI where it's necessary. And um, everywhere we have shared memory, we can use OpenMP. So this seems to be the fitting model for this kind of architecture. Now, of course, there are a lot of questions about the details. Um, the first question is, should we do it at all? Shouldn't MPI be sufficient in all cases? And indeed, there are cases where you uh, there is no, there's no, necessar no necessity to go to OpenMP on the node level. We'll come to that later. And uh, even if you um, decide for MPI plus OpenMP, there are lots of choices. So for example, should you run um, sub teams of threads with multiple MPI processes, or should you run one MPI process per node or something in between? So uh, lots of questions. Now, there's a lot of lore flying around in the internet and in, um, in teaching material as to why we should use MPI plus OpenMP. So many people think that it just fits the hierarchical structure of modern compute nodes. So um, why should we not use it? Because it fits the structure. Now, of course, this is not always the case. Although it fits the structure, OpenMP has its own problems as we investigate it in detail. For example, it has a whole set of um, own overheads, like barrier overhead and tasking overhead, and CCNUMA problems, and so on. And you have to know how to deal with that. And if you don't, then it may be the worst choice. Also, the, another law is that um, using OpenMP on the node reduces the communication volume and number of messages. Now, um, it's mostly true that it does reduce the number of messages, but um, the MPI communication volume can also be optimized in, in programs that use MPI only. So the internode communication volume, what usually counts when you're in the uh, bandwidth saturated regime, may be the same in both cases if you do it right with MPI. Another um, concept is that OpenMP is more lightweight and thus more efficient than MPI on the node level because OpenMP threads are so lightweight and MPI ranks and processes are so heavyweight. This is not generally true. It depends entirely on what you do with OpenMP in the code. Well, one easy comparison is if you look at uh, a full node OpenMP barrier and you know about those numbers, this could be uh, thousands or even tens of thousands of cycles just to synchronize all the threads on a complete node without even uh, looking at some kind of load imbalance, just synchronizing the threads. So tens of thousands of cycles, that's like uh, five microseconds. And MPI latency is between one and two microseconds. So it's in the same ballpark. So it, there's actually not much um, weight to the argument that OpenMP is more lightweight. So to sum this up, there is no definite answer to the question, what's better, pure MPI or a combination of MPI plus OpenMP? It's complicated and it depends heavily on the case at hand. Now, be that as it may, of course, there are um, strong arguments for it and you have to learn how to deal with that. So let's first uh, look into the technical details. Uh, first of all, we need to tell the MPI library that there's some threading going on so it can deal with it properly. Um, so the first step to do this in your program is to use, instead of MPI init for initialization, the other function MPI init thread. MPI init thread, in addition to the argc and argv arguments, which are usual for MPI init too, you need two more arguments, an input and an output argument um, for the required thread level and for the actually provided um, thread compatibility level. So what are these about? You need to tell MPI which kind of interoperability you require between your threading parallelism and your MPI parallelism. 
And in the required argument for MPI init rate, you can specify what you require. Those four values, as listed here, are allowed. So the first is MPI thread single. MPI thread single means that only a single thread will execute. This means there's no threading at all, no threading whatsoever in your program. You're really using only MPI. This is like the standard assumption, of course. You can just as well use MPI init if you're going for that. The second one is MPI thread funneled. MPI thread funneled stands for the situation where only the master thread will make MPI calls, and it doesn't actually matter whether uh, these MPI calls are done within OpenMP parallel regions or out of parallel regions. So it just uh, the, the only requirement is that only the master thread, so the thread that's still running even outside an OpenMP, um, an OpenMP region, will call the MPI library. The next level is MPI thread serialized. This means that you can use MPI calls in any thread you like, but only one at a time. So this means you have to take care that only one thread at a time actually um, calls MPI. So you have to uh, employ some kind of locking scheme or uh, critical regions or whatever to make sure this doesn't happen. The most advanced threading compatibility level is MPI thread multiple. And this uh, specifies that multiple threads may call MPI whenever they want, with no restrictions whatsoever. Now, of course, if you say you want one of these levels, the MPI library might not be able uh, to provide the level you requested. So it gives you an output here in this MPI init thread function uh, to tell you which level is actually provided. So the provided output may be less or more than the required input by the application. So you have to check whether your uh, whether the output, the provided output, is uh, greater or equal the required level. And if it is, you can just proceed. If it's not, it means that your program is not compatible with the MPI library at hand. Now, if you look at these options, then you see immediately that for any threading with MPI, the MPI thread funneled is the minimum level required. MPI thread funnel is actually more than required for many standard hybrid MPI plus OpenMP programs, because if you do MPI calls only between OpenMP parallel regions, so only inside the serial regions of your OpenMP program, then this is less than thread funneled provides. But there's no, there's no level in between thread single and thread funneled. So if you do any threading in your program, MPI thread funneled is the least that you need to specify. So here's an overview again of the uh, thread interoperability levels. I've left out MPI thread single <coughs> because it's a trivial case. So MPI thread funneled means only the master thread is making MPI calls, be it within or out of um, OpenMP parallel regions. MPI thread serialized means everyone can call MPI whenever they want, but only one at a time. So you have to take care that MPI calls within parallel regions are properly um, synchronized so that no two threads call MPI at the same time. MPI thread multiple is full freedom. You can do whatever you want with MPI, and MPI cares internally for the threat safety of your MPI operations. So if we want to um, run a program, we have to first compile and link it, and here's some hints um, how to do that. First of all, of course, we need to activate OpenMP in the compiler with the appropriate switch. So that may be minus OpenMP, minus F OpenMP, whatever your compiler supports. And of course, the appropriate MPI compiler script. Since we're combining MPI and OpenMP, usually we have an MPI compiler wrapper script that takes care of finding the uh, necessary header files and libraries. Then you have to link with the MPI library. This is usually done with the MPI compiler script. Um, a good um, software environment that takes the compatibility between OpenMP and MPI into account will also make sure that whenever you activate OpenMP with the MPI compiler script, um, there will be automatically a thread safe MPI library linked to your program. So this is something you shouldn't need to worry about. And then once you have the binary, 
you need to know how to run the code. Of course, um, this is highly non-portable. The MPI and or OpenMP standards don't tell you anything about the compatibility and how you deal, uh, especially with affinity, how to actually run your code on a, on a particular system. So uh, consult the system documentation if it's available. And this is really something that's it's heavily non-portable. This is very sad, but it's the way it is. If you're on your own, of course, some points need to be considered. For example, the least that you should uh, take care of is that all the OpenMP runtime variables like OpenMP num threads, OMP uh, um, stack size, um, OMP schedule, and, and all those are available to all MPI processes. So this is the least you have to take care about. And of course, since we're now in a situation where uh, part of the parallelism is taken care of by OpenMP, you need to learn how to start fewer MPI processes than available cores on your nodes. Usually MPI environments are set up in a way that if you don't say anything, all uh, physical and or virtual, virtual cores are used for MPI if you start an MPI program. So if you take away some of that parallelism and put it into OpenMP, then um, of course you need to learn how to start fewer MPI processes. Now, um, usually we try to write programs that are uh, also valid serial programs and that it can also be combined with or without one or the other parallelization paradigm. That's not a must, you don't have to do that, but it's very convenient to be able to switch off OpenMP, MPI, or both in your program. Now, if you're going for that, there are some hints, some, some advice you could take. For example, you know that uh, as soon as you open MP, sorry, as soon as you enable OpenMP in your compiler, then this underscore OpenMP symbol is automatically uh, defined in your code. So if you want to uh, mask out OpenMP specific code, all you have to do is use this if def uh, construct, and all that is special for OpenMP goes into here. You can do the same for MPI, of course, but um, if you use an MPI wrapper script to compile your code, there's no such thing as an underscore MPI symbol automatically defined. You have to do that by yourself. So for example, you may want to define a minus D use MPI uh, symbol just by compiler command line, and then do the same thing as with OpenMP, um, define out those things that are special for MPI. Of course, this is something that might be quite hard to do depending on the algorithm you're looking at. Um, because um, MPI parallelism is a little bit more involved usually than OpenMP parallelism. Often you have to restructure your program to write uh, to make it MPI parallel, so it might not be easy or even desirable to uh, try and automatically produce a serial program out of an MPI program. So you may or may not want to do that. Um, sometimes, of course, you need rank and size, more often than not, and then uh, the typical strategy for that is to uh, set rank to zero and size to one, and then use a masked out piece of code to initialize the parallel machine, call com rank and com size, and overwrite rank and size if need be, and so on, of course. Yeah. As I said, this is not something that uh, you have to do, um, but uh, take this advice. And, and if you really want to produce a program that's uh, being able to compile even without OpenMP and with out MPI. So this is this is what you should do. So here's the here are two examples for running a hybrid OpenMP MPI program uh, as soon as you have the binary. Uh, here's a Cray XC4 a machine by Cray. It has two NUMA domains per node with 12 cores each. You compile the code using the normal Fortran compiler on Cray's you're in the fortunate situation that you don't need any um, compiler wrapper scripts. The normal, the usual compilers already know where to find the MPI libraries. You activate OpenMP, you set the number of OpenMP threads, in this case to 12, meaning that we want to um, run 12 threads per MPI process, which would mean, in this case, uh, one process per NUMA domain. And then the command to run the actual program is AP run instead of MPI run, which is the case for many. Other implementations, it's called AP run, and it requires, for example, uh, the number of MPI processes, the number of MPI processes per node, and with minus D, the distance from one process to the next. So with a minus D option, 
you sort of leave the space for the 12 um, OpenMP threads so that each process can spawn 12 threads and these 12 threads will then be pinned to the 12 cores that have been left free by this minus D switch. And then you just um, give the binary. So on a Cray environment, this is all very straightforward and it's, it's well integrated. If you combine, for example, a compiler and um, an MPI implementation that are not from the same vendor, like Intel MPI plus the GCC compiler, then you may run into problems with, with this kind of thing. Another fortunate situation um, is when you have Intel MPI plus an Intel compiler, so OpenMP implementation by Intel, you compile with a wrapper script, MPI IFORT, the OpenMP switch is minus Q OpenMP, as you know, and then um, the MPI run wrapper is MP, uh, the MPI run wrapper is called MPI run actually, and um, you set the number of threads to 10. Uh, PPN says processes per node, so we want to run two processes per node, and four processes overall minus MP4. The specification of the affinity options is a little bit more involved here. It's very um, advanced and could be very complicated, but if we do want, want to do a simple thing like pin one team of threads to one socket and the other one to the other socket, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, you specify two more, two additional um, environment variables, I and PI pin domain. Here we set it to socket, meaning that the pinning unit in terms of MPI is the socket. One MPI process will go to one socket, the next process will go to the next socket. And then within the socket, you need to tell how to distribute the threads. And this is done with KMP affinity. We set this to scatter, meaning that we want to scatter out the OpenMP threads within the socket as far as possible. And if that's a cluster with um, simultaneous multi-threading enabled, then this would mean that we're running our 10 threads on the 10 physical cores of this socket. All right, so now we know how to compile, link, and run a program. Some nomenclature, which will come up later when we deal with, um, with case studies. Now with pure MPI, this is shown on the left, pure MPI means we're running one MPI process per physical or virtual core. There's no threading at all. And all the substructure of the system, uh, all the topology, all the hierarchy is actually ignored. Okay, this is pure MPI. Fully hybrid is what we call the situation where one MPI process encompasses all the threads necessary to deal with the parallelism within the full node. So one MPI process per node, and all the threading is done inside the node, and the threading takes care of the node parallelism. OpenMP is done within a node, nothing else. And then we have a kind of mixed mode uh, where more than one MPI process is run per node, and more than one OpenMP thread is run per process. As I told you, running the code is highly non-portable, so there are many options, and um, fortunately there are tools that, that ease the burden of uh, getting to run an MPI plus OpenMP program on a modern cluster, and one of these tools is Liquid MPI Run. It actually abstracts away the details of the underlying OpenMP and MPI implementations. So in this example, we have a dual socket six core cluster with hyperthreading enabled. In this picture, we see two of those nodes. What we want to do is run a fully hybrid code according to the nomenclature on the previous slide. So running one MPI process per node with, um, with 12 threads running only on the physical cores of these nodes. So how do we do that? With Liquid MPI Run, it's actually quite simple. We specify the number of MPI processes as usual with minus NP2, and then uh, the minus pin argument tells Liquid MPI Run how to pin the threads within the MPI process. So in this case, we specify a, an affinity uh, string that is actually the same as with a liquid pin tool that I introduced earlier in the lecture. So n colon 0 to 11, this means take all the uh, physical cores of the system, enumerate them starting with zero up to the number of physical cores, and pin the OpenMP threads sequentially to those cores. 
Okay, that's what we want to do. We want to populate only the physical cores of these nodes. And we do it with two nodes here. Now that's easy enough, we'll look at MPI run. It abstracts away the details of the underlying MPI and, and, and uh, OpenMP implementations. With Intel MPI and the Intel compiler, it's actually uh, not much more complicated. You set the number of threads to 12, you say MPI run, one process per node, two processes overall, and the affinity for the OpenMP threads should be set to scatter as in the previous example. Okay, so in this case, it's actually not much, not more complicated to use Intel MPI in the compiler, especially because we're dealing with a one vendor thing. Okay, both things, Intel MPI plus Intel compiler are from the same vendor. Now let's start a mixed mode program. So we want to run one process with six, six threads per socket, and there may be a good this may be a good case for a practical application, as we will see later, because you're um, you're circumventing a lot of NUMA problems with that. So mixed mode, um, each socket should run one MPI process, again, only populating the physical cores, but now we're running two processes per node. So with the given MPI run, we specify four MPI processes, and the pinning string is now a little bit more complicated. It has multiple parts separated by an underscore, and the underscore is the process separator in liquid MPI run, so what's left of the underscore, this is the description of the pinning for the first process. And to the right of the underscore, this is the pinning for the second process. The first process should go to the first six physical cores of socket zero, and the second process should go to the first six physical cores of socket one. All right. Now with Intel MPI and Intel compiler, it's a little bit more complicated. We've seen this before. We're running six OpenMP threads, two processes per node, four processes overall. The MPI pinning domain is the socket. So um, MPI processes are placed on successive sockets. And within the socket, we're using a scatter, um, a scatter policy to distribute the threads. So it gets a little bit more complicated. Overall, Liquid MPI run is actually the preferred choice because it abstracts away all the complications of using different implementations of MPI and OpenMP. Okay, so much for the technicalities. Now let's come back to the pros and cons of using pure MPI as opposed to MPI plus OpenMP. Of course, the most compelling argument for only using MPI is that it's simpler to program and affinity is easier to enforce than if you combine it with another programming model. Um, another advantage that might not be so obvious is that uh, if you run multiple MPI processes per node, then uh, chances are that you will also be communicating with multiple MPI processes on other nodes. And this may be good in terms of bandwidth, network bandwidth saturation, because some networks need multiple processes to saturate the asymptotic bandwidth. We'll see an example for that later. Of course, if you don't have any threading, there are no threat safety concerns. You need to be concerned. You don't need to be concerned about uh, whether or not the MPI library is threat safe or whether your parallel loops are threat safe. That's all um, not an issue for you. Also, there's only one level of Amdahl's law. If you combine two parallel programming models, there will always be two levels of Amdahl's law. Okay, two serial fractions that you have to deal with. A similar argument applies to overheads. If you only have MPI, you only deal with MPI overheads. And uh, if you add OpenMP, then you add, well, OpenMP barrier overhead, tasking overhead, all the other things that come together with OpenMP. And of course, finally, um, if you use MPI and do the pinning right, then you may not encounter any CCNUMA page placement problems because each process does its own memory allocation and memory initialization, and memory will end up naturally in one core's local domain, as opposed to OpenMP, where NUMA placement, as you know, can be handled with parallel first touch, probably not perfectly. So that's a problem you don't have to look at if you only use MPI. Of course, there are uh, corner cases, problems also if you with MPI only, for example, if the operating system um, 
keeps a certain part of the main memory for internal buffer cache, then you can still run into NUMA problems even with MPI only, but that's actually something that, that can be dealt with um, on a different level. Of course, there are also downsides for um, using pure MPI without adding OpenMP. Of course, with pure MPI, it's it's hard enough to parallelize a program in the first place. Often, if you do MPI, you need to restructure your whole code to make it parallel. And then um, you usually target one particular level of parallelism. Now, in order to exploit multiple levels, for example, a, le a level on the uh, level of parallelism on the algorithm level and another one on the data processing level or data parallelism level, that's hard to do in MPI. Usually you address only a single level of parallelism. With OpenMP added on top, you may be able to do that. You may be able to address two different levels of parallelism and get more parallelism out of that, meaning you can use more resources, more hardware to tackle the same problem. Some MPI programs have a big problem in terms of replicated data. If you run MPI, then uh, you may get tempted to allocate data structures on all MPI processes, although you might not need them on all MPI processes. So this replicated data problem is um, sometimes getting out of hand. And this means for such programs, the fewer MPI pro processes you run, the less replicated data you get. We'll see an example for this later. Also, MPI only means you have to address the full hardware parallelism with MPI. So you're running lots of processes. Remember that today's multi-core systems have 20, 30, 40, even 60 cores per um, socket. And um, that means you're running lots of processes. And that means you're sending and receiving lots of messages. And even, uh, even though um, intranode MPI is faster than internode MPI. It's not infinitely fast as we saw with the benchmarks. So lots of messages may mean lots of overhead. With MPI only, load balancing is difficult. If you have a problem that requires dynamic load balancing, so dynamically shifting workloads between MPI processes, that may be extremely hard to do with MPI. And there's a whole bag of research about that. Uh, just how do you dynamically load balance MPI applications? That's, that gets a lot of lot easier with OpenMP because um, if you do things like tasking or dynamic loop scheduling, then the OpenMP runtime takes care of the load balancing. So this is much simpler, at least to a certain level, at least on the level of parallelism um, you look at on the single node with OpenMP than with MPI. And finally, as we also discussed uh, when we looked at MPI performance and non-blocking MPI point-to-point -point communication, there's no guarantee that non-blocking MPI communication actually will give you overlapping communication. So it depends on the implementation. And um, the only way to be absolutely sure is to sacrifice a thread of your OpenMP team and do the communication explicitly in the background. And we'll see later how this works. In the following, we're going to look into some of these issues in more detail. Here's an experiment on the Hawk system at the Stuttgart High Performance Computing Center. A Hawk system has a very intricate node structure with two sockets, 64 cores per socket, and hyperthreading enabled. Um, there's a complicated hierarchical cache structure and chip structure. And so we expect a complicated um, behavior with respect to performance um, of communication across the topology. Now, what we did here was run a so-called multi-mode ping-pong test on the system in two different uh, variants, internode and internode. An internode multi-mode ping-pong test means we're running the usual ping-pong, but with multiple communicating pairs of processes at the same time. So one communicating pair, that's the standard, the usual um, ping-pong test, just sending a message from one process to the other on the other node and then back you measure the time and uh, you track the aggregate uh, effective communication bandwidth with multiple communicating pairs simultaneously you see that on this system you get more bandwidth as you increase the number of pairs and this means for this, this experiment that a single communicating pair is not able to saturate the asymptotic communication bandwidth 
That's not always the case, especially with commodity interconnects. Usually a single communicating pair can saturate the bandwidth, but not in this case. So here there's a compelling argument for running more than one MPI process per node because you want to make best use of the available communication bandwidth. And if you're actually bandwidth bound, you want to be in that asymptotic bandwidth regime. And this means on this system, you need at least three or four communicating pairs. So um, multiple MPI processes per node seem to be in order to achieve that. So uh, with the intranode experiment, it looks a little different. Intranode means that all the processes, all the process pairs are running within a node. A node is 128 cores, so we can run up to 64 intranode pairs for the ping pong experiment. What we see here that up to eight pairs and that's 16 cores, 16 cores is one NUMO domain, we get pretty much constant aggregate bandwidth and beyond a single NUMO domain, the bandwidth scales linearly. So this is as expected. We have scalable bandwidth within one node due to this CC NUMA feature and um, it's about four times higher than the internode bandwidth. So if you really have a communication overhead problem within the node, also you want to make best use of it. And this also seems to imply that multiple communicating MPI processes within the node are probably a good idea. Of course, if you drop MPI altogether within the node, all this overhead also goes away, but then you have to deal with the OpenMP overhead. So this is just uh, to tell you what the phenomenology is on some systems. All right, so the asymptotic aggregate bandwidth for multiple communicating MPI uh, process pairs is really different if you look at internode versus internode behavior. And also in the internode case, some networks require multiple communicating pairs to get actually to the asymptotic bandwidth. So this is actually a case for multiple MPI processes per node. Another issue I uh, touched upon is saving memory with hybrid MPI plus OpenMP. Here's a case study, it's already quite old, 2010, but still valid. So what we see here is um, runs, not in terms of performance, but in terms of memory usage. And uh, these runs are normalized to a case where 256 processes are run with one MPI, uh, sorry, one OpenMP thread. So these, this, this pair of bars is for MPI only. What we see here is data for the so-called NAS parallel benchmarks. It's a very popular benchmark suite that has uh, simple applications from fluid dynamics and related fields. And we're running two benchmarks here, BTMZ and SPMZ. I'm not going into details uh, about what they're doing. Uh, this was on a Cray XT5. Now, these benchmarks take a certain amount of memory if you run them with MPI only, and then Keeping the overall amount of resources the same, we increase the number of OpenMP threads and decrease accordingly the number of MPI processes. So overall, the number of resources used stays the same, but we're shifting parallelism from MPI to OpenMP. And in this diagram, we see that in doing that, the overall memory usage goes down by a factor of five. This means that there's a lot of replicated data in this MPI program that gets reduced as you reduce the overall number of MPI processes. So this may or may not be a problem in your case. Of course, this is an extreme case. It's not the same with all MPI programs, but it's something to keep on the radar. The next problem is communication with computation overlap. Now, um, as I've already mentioned, the naive approach would be to try non-blocking MPI calls and rely on the MPI library to actually perform the communication asynchronously while the computation goes on in the foreground. So in our example here, we have Cartesian domain decomposition with halos. Um, we have an iteration loop around the whole thing. And then uh, we kick off the communication of the halo. So with I send and I receive pairs, we communicate halo data to and from the neighbors. At the same time, we're trying to do the update of the bulk grid points, so all the points that don't need the boundary data, and while at the same time, hopefully in the background, the MPI um, does the right thing and transfers the data. Then after that, after the, the bulk is completed, 
we can use wait all to wait for the communications to complete and then update the boundary points, which then also need the halo data. So this is the way um, that you would write a program if you would rely on the MPI library to do asynchronous communication. Now we know already that this may or may not work. It depends on the implementation. I already show you this, uh, uh, showed you this performance experiment where we overlapped a configurable amount of work with uh, a fixed data transfer. And we saw that depending on the configuration of the MPI library on this particular MPI library, we may or may not get uh, overlapping, truly asynchronous communication. In any case, it's not guaranteed by non-blocking MPI. Um, so fortunately, hybrid MPI plus OpenMP, making every MPI process multi-threaded, provides a solution to this problem. So here is the idea. Let's assume we have a multi-threaded MPI process and um, we sacrifice one um, OpenMP thread to do the communication. So we have a construct like this. If my thread rank, so my thread ID is smaller than one, so thread number zero goes into this branch, then uh, it does all the communication of halo data, while the other threads, the rest of the team, executes those part of the application that do not meet the halo. So this is the green part in our example. And then finally, um, once this is done, we can execute those parts of the, of the application that need the halo data. So all this. All right. So um, this is really a simple idea. However, it has some problems. Here's a more detailed kind of pseudocode um, that shows how this may work. The first problem you're facing is the application problem. You need to separate the application into those two parts, the bulk part and the boundary part, which is sort of easy if you think in terms of Cartesian decomposition, but in terms of irregular volumes, for example, it may be more complicated, maybe harder to do because you need to index all these boundary volumes. So this is actually a programming problem. It's, it may not be so difficult to solve. Um, more severe problem is the subteams problem. We need to split up the OpenMP team into a communicating subteam and a computing subteam. Even though the communicating subteam sometimes is only a single thread, um, this means that those convenient work sharing directives like OMP4 are not easily applicable. You see this in this example. Um, I'm sacrificing one thread here to do the communication, and all the other n minus one threads, they now have to do all the work distribution by themselves. So we have to figure out what's my range as a thread, what's my lower and my higher limit. Um, and this is of course um, error prone, although it may seem simple for simple cases, um, it's something you don't wanna do. It's actually what, what the OpenMP runtime was designed to do. And of course, all the load balancing, if that's necessary, must be done manually. Now th again, that's simple if all your volumes, all your sub, um, um, subdomains are of the same size, but that's not always the case. So um, again, load balancing in OpenMP, if you have a full team, that's simple. You just use an appropriate schedule clause. But if you sacrifice one thread and you have a subteam at your disposal, then you lose all this, this simple um, functionality. Now, what can we do? Of course, OpenMP is not just about simple loop parallelism. And um, in practice, it may not be so bad. We already talked about the OpenMP task loop uh, construct. Uh, task loop breaks a loop into chunks and makes them tasks. But that seems to be something that's uh, unnecessarily complex because why should we do that if we have something like dynamic loop scheduling, not using the tasking feature at all? The attractive property of the task loop is that it can be combined with normal tasks that are uh, kicked off in a normal way using a task directive. So here's what our um, halo communication example might look like uh, in practice. So we open a parallel region, you open a single region because we're dealing with tasks here and you only want to kick off tasks from a single thread and then uh, we actually have two constructs here, a task and a task loop. The task construct does the communication of the halo. And once that is complete, it does the update of the boundary because that's now possible since we just communicated the halo. Um, 
The other part, the other construct is a task loop construct that may use all the advanced functionality of task loops, for example, uh, setting the grain size to some, some, some grain size that's uh, probably not as prone to uh, overheads as a grain size of one, and then you update the bulk. So the downside of that is, of course, that all these grains that are produced here are actually tasks and that may add um, some overhead, okay? But the, the attractive feature is that it's combined now with this uh, communication and compute boundary task. And whenever, whichever thread executes this blue task, whenever it's ready, it can, can participate in the purple task or one of the purple tasks of the task loop so that no resources are actually sacrificed. There's no problem with threads sleeping because there's nothing to do. All threads that don't have anything to do just go to the global task queue and execute whatever is available in this global task queue. So this solves at least two of the three problems. Still, we have to divide our application into the halo boundary part and the bulk part, of course. That may be hard to do, but uh, the overlapping problem and the load balancing problem, they are solved by this. Of course, there's always a downside. And the biggest downside is that since now we're dealing with dynamic scheduling and we can't really control which thread executes which task, um, we may face problems with CC NUMA placement. All right, so if one team of, of threads spends more than a NUMA domain, then this tasking approach does not have full control over which that accesses which data, and you may have some non-locality and contention problems. Also, tasks uh, do actually show more overhead than standard uh, workshed parallel loops, so that may add uh, to your problems. Let me conclude with an interesting case study that we published um, now almost a decade ago about sparse matrix vector multiplication. It actually makes a good case for hybrid programming with MPI and OpenMP and also shows some of the limitations and um, phenomena that we discussed so far. Now, we haven't covered sparse matrices up to now. What's a sparse matrix? A sparse matrix means that it's a matrix in which most of the entries are zero. Um, and those matrices can describe very interesting physical setups like in quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry. Um, there are a couple of definitions about what constitutes a sparse matrix. For me, a matrix is sparse when uh, the number of non-zeros in the matrix, which is in any case small compared to the overall number of entries in the matrix, grows more slowly than quadratically with n. Okay, so the number, if n is the number of uh, degrees of freedom on a physical problem, then if you increase the number of degrees of freedom, usually in a dense matrix, the number of entries in the matrix grows quadratically with n. In a sparse matrix or in a problem which is described by a sparse matrix, this number of entries grows more slowly than quadratically, usually linearly with n. An important number that uh, comes up often in these kinds of analysis is the number of non-zeros per row of such a matrix. In many quantum physics problems, this number is quite low. It could be as low as 5 or 7 or 15. So these numbers, uh, these matrices are often quite skinny in the sense that they only have very few non-zeros per row. Of course, there may be exceptions where the number of zeros per row is in the tens or hundreds. As you may imagine, the fingerprint of the matrix, so the, the actual sparsity pattern of the non-zeros within the full matrix, constitutes uh, different classes of problems. And um, this sparsity pattern also has a big influence on how this, um, these operations perform that we do with these matrices. Now, one operation that's very important in this context is the sparse matrix vector multiplication. In many algorithms, we need to multiply a very large sparse matrix with a right-hand side vector, which happens to be dense. So we multiply the matrix A with a right-hand side vector, and we get a left-hand side vector C. This operation is usually memory-bound if the number of non-zeros is um, so large that it doesn't fit into any cache anymore. So um, of course, um, in order to do this matrix vector multiplication, we need to read the right-hand side vector, we need to update the left-hand side vector, and we need to read all the matrix entries. So the basic operation is quite similar to dense 
matrix vector multiplication, with the exception that most of the entries are zero, so mo for most of the entries we're not doing anything at all. The sparsity pattern of the matrix has a very strong impact on the performance of those operation. Also, the order uh, and the way in which these non-zeros are stored in memory is decisive. And um, as it happens, there's a whole industry of storage formats for sparse matrices. The most popular format is called CRS, Compressed Row Storage. This is actually quite good for modern cache-based uh, microprocessors. Um, another popular format, which is was more popular in the past, is Jack Diagonals. Uh, it's best for vector-like architectures from the past, and there's there's many more. So, uh, actually, there's one format that fits uh, each architecture best, and there's also a couple of formats around that are good for a wide spectrum of computer architectures. Some special formats exist that exploit specific properties of such sparse matrices. For example, in many physical problems, this sparse matrix has dense substructures, like dense submatrices of a smaller size uh, that can then be efficiently stored and dealt with more effectively than uh, assuming no special substructure. So if you look for sparse matrix algorithms and optimization, you will find hundreds of papers dealing with this problem. Now, as I told you, um, sparse matrix vector multiplication is a key ingredient in many algorithms. So, for example, a lot of eigenvalue solvers like Lanchers, Davidson, and Jacobi Davidson, they have this at the heart of the algorithm, and uh, far more than 95% of the computing time is spent multiplying a sparse matrix with a vector. Also, many sparse linear solvers uh, have this property like Jacobi, Gauss-Seidel, conjugate gradients, and all the derivatives um, we know. They also have as a dominant operation the multiplication of a sparse matrix with a vector. So here in this example we chose a symmetric sparse matrix. In general it doesn't have to be symmetric, it just happens to be in this example. And here's what happens. We go through this matrix row by row just as we do with the dense matrix. And for each row we pick all the non-zeros. Of course we ignore the zeros in between. For each non-zero we find which right-hand side vector entries um, are relevant for this particular row. We do the relevant matrix vector, sorry, we do the relevant uh, multiply add operations on the non zeros of the row with the right hand side vector entries, and we update the left hand side vector. Of course, if we look at this, assuming that we can find some kind of um, effective storage, compressed storage format for the matrix, um, the left hand side vector axis is very cache friendly. So we're updating each element in turn and its um, consecutive axis in memory, so cache line friendly. However, on the right side, on the right hand side, we need some indirect address addressing. And this indirect addressing, well, it depends on the sparsity structure of the matrix, but um, if the matrix is very scattered, very randomly um, distributed, then it means that the right hand side axis may be a big performance problem. And there's also some some models we can make about that, which I'm not going to go into detail here. Now, what we want to look at here is the distributed memory parallelization of sparse matrix vector multiplication. And it's not so different from dense matrix vector multiplication with MPI. Um, it's just that now, since the matrix is sparse, it doesn't make sense to actually communicate the full right-hand side vector using a ring shift. Um, across all MPI processes. So here's the deal. <clears throat> In this example, we have four MPI processes, P0 to P3. Each MPI process gets a horizontal strip of the matrix, just as we did it with the dense matrix vector. Now, um, and again, as with dense matrix vector, we're also distributing the left-hand side and right-hand side vectors, which is now even more important because depending on how many non-zeros per row the matrix has, the left and right hand side vectors may be a considerable contribution to the overall uh, memory requirement. So uh, it's really imperative that those are also distributed. Now, since the upper part of the right hand side vector also resides on P0, there's also, like in the dense matrix vector example, there's also this part of the matrix that can be multiplied with the local part of the vector right away. So this is a purely local operation and no communication is required. However, for all those parts for which the right-hand side vector 
does not reside on the current process, there has to be some communication. So these non-local right-hand side elements for P0, they reside on the other processes. Now, as opposed to the ring shift procedure we looked at when we dealt with the dense matrix vector, the more efficient way to, to do this here is to actually identify the particular non-zeros that we need in this part of the matrix and only communicate those parts of the right-hand side vector that are actually needed on each process. Since the matrix is generally very sparse, uh, this will usually be much more efficient than communicating the full right-hand side vector. So you need to figure out which uh, right-hand side entries do we need for each process from the other processes to be communicated, and this is then the MPI communication overhead. Of course, this can be done in parallel with doing the local operation, the local matrix, um, matrix tile times the local right-hand side vector. Uh, chunk. All right, so there are now a couple of um, strategies you may follow when doing that. The first strategy is what we call vector mode without overlap. It's actually the naive way to deal with MPI plus OpenMP parallelism. And uh, what you do is the, the, all the computation um, is using multi-threading with OpenMP, using all the available threads. Okay, so here's a diagram. Um, number of threads working versus time. Since we're not trying to overlap any communication here, all we do is try to gather uh, all the elements needed to do the full sparse matrix vector multiplication locally. So we kick off a couple of I receives to collect all these elements and um, in order to send the local elements that are needed by other processes, we have to gather them locally into a contiguous buffer and transfer them using an iSend and then we do a wait all. So this way we can at least make sure that some of the communication will be bidirectional. But once the wait all is finished, all the necessary data on each process is available to do the full sparse matrix vector multiplication with all elements, local as well as non-local. So this is called master only style since MPI communication only takes place outside of the computation. Now, the benefit of the threading in the MPI process in this strategy is only due to possible message aggregation because um, we're aggregating many messages here into one and probably better load balancing because we can load balance the full sparse matrix vector operation in one go. We don't have to split it and then um, care about load balancing separately for the local and the non-local part. Okay, so this is what we call vector mode because it resembles the, the way we did, um, we did MPI programming with the old style vector computers. Of course, we're aiming at overlapping communication here. So that's what variant two tries to do. We call it vector mode with naive overlap or um, good faith hybrid. It relies on MPI to support asynchronous non-blocking point-to-point -point communication. So still we're doing computation with all threads since uh, we not we don't have to sacrifice one thread for communication uh, programming is still simple but we need to do the separation into two parts so uh, here in this timeline diagram again we kick off the receiving of all the non-local vector parts we gather everything that needs to be sent to someone else we do the i sends and then once the i sends are done we rely on mpi to do the communication in the background of course the only Part of the work we can now do is the sparse matrix vector multiplication with the local vector elements. And hopefully this is this takes long enough uh, to amortize the cost for the background communication. Then the wait all that comes after that is probably very short because the communication was already done. And then since we have the non-local parts now gathered locally, we can do the non-local part of the computation. So we're separating the matrix vector multiplication into two subunits, the local and the non-local part. Now, this doesn't seem to be a problem. However, there's a drawback because the result vector has to be written twice to memory. We write it once when we do the local part and we update it a second time when we write the non-local part. So we need to modify the performance model. There's a little bit more memory traffic involved here, and this may or may not impact the performance, and we'll see performance data later.
all right, so this will work if the MPI library does support asynchronous non-blocking point-to-point -point communication. Now, as we know, this doesn't always work, and we may revert to variant 3, which we call task mode, since it's a kind of um, functional parallelization where a, a part of the team of threads uh, does the communication, where the rest of the team does the computation. So we do explicit overlap, as I explained in the introduction. This is more complex to implement, of course, because you have to deal with um, a team of threads that's now only n minus one threads, and you need to do all the load balancing and work distribution manually or using tasking. Now, in this case, in this case study, we did it manually. So here's the timeline. Uh, we set up the receiving. Um, at the same time, n minus one threads can do the local copy of the elements that need to be sent. We need to synchronize, then these elements can be sent and the local sparse matrix vector multiplication can be done in parallel with all the communication. Another synchronization is necessary and then we can do the non-local part. Now this strategy guarantees that the communication will be done in the background asynchronously because we sacrifice one thread that cares for that. Even if the communication is all done in MPI wait all, it will be asynchronous. The same drawback as in good faith hybrid applies. The result vector must be written twice to memory. Uh, so the um, performance model must be modified and there is no simple OpenMP work sharing. Okay, so you need to revert to manual work sharing or tasking. In this case, we used manual work sharing because the matrices we dealt with here uh, did not have any particularly uh, difficult structure in terms of load balancing. So here are the results. There's a lot of data, so um, I'd like to draw your attention to the important parts. What we see is performance in gigaflops per second versus number of nodes used for three different cases. The first case is one MPI process per physical core. OpenMP is still being used, but only for splitting off a thread and doing the communication in the background. So um, the threading is actually only used for overlapping the communication. All the work is done with a single thread per MPI process. The middle panel runs uh, is for one MPI process per NUMA locality domain. So this is a mixed mode um, situation where we are, uh, one team of threads spans one NUMA locality domain. This is probably a solution uh, that you choose if you don't know how to deal with NUMA problems on the OpenMP level. And the third panel is for one MPI process per node. So full, fully hybrid situation where all the parallelism inside the node is handled by OpenMP. Now let's look at the first uh, panel, one MPI process per core. We distinguish three cases here, vector mode without overlap. So this is the, uh, the standard case without, without overlap of any kind. Then vector mode with naive overlap in black, dotted dash line, and task mode, explicit overlap in blue. You see that um, the vector mode with naive overlap is actually a little bit slower across the whole um, scalability curve than the vector mode without overlap. And this is because there's not any overlap at all here in this particular situation with this particular system and MPI library. And you get a performance penalty because the left-hand side vector needs to be updated multiple times. So more traffic over the memory bus, more time to do this traffic, less performance. The task mode, which utilizes hyper-threading to um, use the second virtual core to do the communication is actually better. Um, so this, this drawback of having to write the left-hand side vector twice is overcompensated by, um, by doing the explicitly asynchronous communication. However, the parallel efficiency is still limited and um, still we'd like to look at the other options. So here, um, If we look at the right panel, one MPI process per node, that's where we get the best results. <clears throat> we see that task mode is actually much better than the other options. And we get, for example, at 24 nodes, like um, a 20, 25% speed up um, for task mode with respect to vector mode or vector mode with naive overlap. So this doesn't look too interesting or too exciting, just 25% uh, speed up. However, that's not all there is to it. I've put some markers here on these, on these data sets to show you where the point is reached 
where the pedal efficiency actually drops below 50%. From an efficiency point of view, that's probably the point beyond which you don't want to go. All right, so you want to stop scaling here because if you if you scale out further, then more than 50% of your resources are not utilized since your pedal efficiency is below 50%. Now you see this point is reached for uh, vector mode computations here at eight nodes. However, for task mode computation, it's only reached at 24 nodes. This means you can use a larger amount of resources with an acceptable parallel efficiency. The 50% efficiency point is only reached at 24 nodes here with task mode as opposed to eight nodes with vector mode. So you can use three times more resources effectively. And this is the actual benefit of doing the overlapping here. It's not just for the 25% speed up because you wouldn't actually want to go here with standard vector mode, because at this point, the pedal efficiency is already way below 50%. You want to stop scaling down here at eight nodes. And with task mode, you can scale out to 24 nodes with acceptable efficiency. So this is the actual benefit of overlapping. It's not just comparing um, performance using a given set of nodes, it's actually looking at scalability and answering the questions, how much the question how much uh, resources can I use without uh, violating a sort of given efficiency barrier. So this is the actual thing. Now let's look at, at a different matrix. In this example, um, this is a matrix from quantum mechanics and it gave us ample speed up for overlapping because there is actually a lot of communication overhead. So this, this problem is dominated by communication overhead. Here's another matrix. It only has about seven non-zeros per row. And you see that um, the vector mode and vector mode with naive overlap and the task mode, they show very similar behavior. Actually, the naive overlap and the task mode are way below the natural, the, the normal vector mode in terms of performance. And this stays that way, no matter how many threads per MPI process we're using. Now, the point here is that for this particular matrix, communication overhead doesn't play a particularly large role. So communication overhead is insignificant. And this means the dominant effect when going, uh, when trying to overlap the communication is the multiple writes to the left-hand side. This costs time because of um, increased left-hand side traffic. And this is why we always lose when going with this strategy. So um, the take-home message here is that if MPI is good enough, don't bother going hybrid. And this is a very strong case for actually looking at your case, your application at hand, and analyzing whether or not it makes sense to go hybrid. If MPI does the job, don't bother. So now we come to the conclusions about hybrid MPI plus OpenMP. Don't be fooled by lore and anecdotal evidence. People tell you, uh, a lot of stories about how their hybrid code was much worse than their pure MPI code. Don't believe anything unless you did the experiments yourself under a controlled environment. The benefit of going hybrid depends heavily on the particular code. There's no silver bullet and there's no single answer for all cases. The main advantage for combining these two programming models is you get the, the option for explicit communication overlap. You have easier load balancing um, by means of OpenMP and less internode MPI communication, that's for sure. Main challenges include um, overhead generated by OpenMP and CCNUMA placement problems. If possible, and that's probably the best advice you can take home from here, if possible, use a performance model to check whether your MPI implementation is good enough. And if it is, don't bother making your program more complicated than it actually is. Thank you.